Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, yes, I'm very impressed with how quickly you can have people. Uh, very good indeed. So yes, I'm uh, Gillian Hobel. I'm an ancient historian and an archaeologist. And I'm uh, going to talk to you about Yarsov. Now, I know that we're going to Orkney tomorrow, but there will be no more time between now and Yarsov in Shetland. And also, Yarsov is a fantastic site that gives us for over 4,000 years of history. So this is your chance to get your chronology and your timeline into place. Because it's a small site, but it contains just about every era of history that you can walk through. So you're about to travel through 4,000 years of time. So the archaeological duel of Shetland for that very reason. Here's where we've been. We've been Thlaam, we've been Bergen, and we're sailing across here. Uh, if it gets a little rocky, I will try not to sway, because I find that if I do that, you don't feel particularly well. <laughs> so, <laughs> I will anchor myself. Uh, so we're heading to Shetland across here. And in that time, we will go into the Neolithic, the New Stone Age, when the very first farmers were settling down. We shall go through the Bronze Age, when the very first metals are there, and invented. And the Iron Age, where iron comes into it, obviously, it moves on into the Pictish, which is a specific particular era for this part of the world, and into the Viking or early medieval, and then the medieval, all on one little site, which if you wanted to, you could probably run around in 10 minutes, but I don't advise it. <laughs> Let's take our time to go through these areas. Here's the aerial shot of the site that you're going to, and you will travel through time by going round here, through here, into the Viking and then up into the 1600s for the house which was built on top of all these areas. It wasn't until uh, in the 1800s when a storm washed away the cliff, which is now reinforced, and took half the buildings with it. But they realized what was underneath this house. The answer office down here, the South Point of Shetland, we will come in and we will drive down and then drive back, or vice versa, one way or the other. And Shetland, and the answer office at the very South Point. Let's start at the beginning, the Neolithic, 2500 BC. That's a tiny, weeny bit later, by 100 years, to the Great Pyramids. So you're going back to the time of the Great Pyramids. On Orkney, we will go back much further. But here, this is where the story starts in Yarsop. This little patch here. What do you do when you're first settling down? You need fresh water. You need soils which are easy to plow. You have no metal plowshares. You just need a piece of wood to plow the soil. You need stone for the building of your houses. Because in Shetland, there were very, very few trees, virtually treeless. So for the archaeological uh, joy of it all is that they built using stone because there was no wood. So wood decays, stone does not. Hence the remains that we have. And on the shore, right beside Yarsov, you will see, if you peer slightly further, so when you stand here, if you peer down here, you will see these slabs of stone. And the, the setting of the stones is like this. You can literally see the pieces that you could take off, especially down <coughs> on the shore. It's all ready, perfect for building. So what more could you want? But it starts with just a few stones and large amounts of midden. That's archaeological speak for rubbish tips. A lot of seafood from the previous eras, and they set themselves down to be surrounded by these middens because they make good insulation. Now, as I suspect when we're standing there tomorrow, you'll realize why they have good insulation. Because you're on the end of an island, and there is nothing between you and the rest of the Atlantic. So you need that insulation. It's also over the generations, it's what your, your parents or grandparents have built. This is where you live. This is the actual space that is yours. So you settle down, build your stone houses set into this midden. It doesn't smell, it's like compost settles down, it doesn't smell, it's quite clean. Now that doesn't look much. Uh, as one guest once said to me, well it's a load of old stones. My challenge is to tell you it's not just a load of old stones. When you're standing here and you're allowed onto the grass, you can go and stand in and amongst houses which are four and a half thousand years old. If you can get your head into that. And they are not primitives, they are people like us. 
There are people with the same imagination, the same abilities. They were taking the stone, they were building it, they were building something that they liked aesthetically, that was practical, they had engineering skills that they learned from each other, and through experience, you build a house, it falls down, you learn how to build a house that doesn't fall down. You learn. It's what we do as homo sapiens. So then they are in their stone houses, and they have materials. They use uh, bone and ivory, and they create patterns on it. Now, Neolithic art is very much zigzags, it's lozenges, and this is the kind of art that's on a piece that's in the Kirkwall Museum. We don't know what it signifies, but it, because it's so widespread amongst the Neolithic world, could it just be it's a natural shape for us to do, or has it got a story? Uh, we don't know what the stories might be. But then if you took a cross, and you didn't know which way up it went, and you didn't know any of the stories, you would never create the Easter story out of a cross. Never in a million years, if you had no records. And of course, prehistory is a time without records. So we depend on the archaeology. Now, some of the archaeology is this that looks like a rather sad chocolate digestive biscuit. Uh, don't eat it, although archaeologists do sometimes taste to know what minerals are and things. Uh, it's pottery. Now, you don't have pottery until after you've settled down. For the obvious reasons that if you're moving around, it's heavy, it breaks. So you can't transport it around. And here you can see the, the mats, the marking of the, which they made the pots on. No wheel to spin around. You just put, take the clay, you put inclusions in it to make it fit better, and you shape whatever you want. But this is amongst the first natural man-made objects or subject material, the material ever. You take clay, you take a natural material, and you bake it, and it becomes pottery. That's the imagination that's used in the Neolithic to create one of the first man-made products. It you know, travels on. We will talk more about the Neolithic tomorrow. Uh, I should be able to talk on the Neolithic, and uh, Dick Card will talk about the Nessa Vodka, the great part of the Neolithic site. Uh, she's changing the world for us for archaeology. But moving into the Bronze Age, here right next to the Neolithic, Quite close to it, it's really rare to get different sites with different, well, the same site with different ages on it. And you have several houses, and in them have been found pottery molds for making bronze items. Now, bronze is copper and tin. Tin might come from as far away as Cornwall. So you're talking about links, they're travelling by the sea, by going by boat. And we had a few Bronze Age boats but nothing before that, but people must have travelled by boat, good boats, to actually get to the islands of Shetland. So you have this bronze, which you pour into moulds, and they have moulds for axes, knives, and swords, which sounds very warlike. Suddenly you're making particular tools for weapons. Here's a replica in the little site museum, and one of the axe heads now here's to use your imagination. You've used flint, you've used stone, you've used bone, you've used ivory. You've become wonderful at making all sorts of objects, including plant objects. And then this shiny material appears out of rock. You can take rock, put it in a furnace, and come out with something that's fluid, and you can shape it into something that shines and glistens. And it's status object, as well as actually being a very useful material to have. Imagine seeing metal for the very first time, how it would change the way that you view the world. You can now take something and turn it into something which you decide what shape it is. Here are the houses, and they've got little multi cells. Nice half in the middle, little cells around it, still got uh, protection around the outside, right up close to the Neolithic there. And you, they're a little bit more complex, but that could be because they're younger and they survive better. We have some bones, animal bones, which they've kept in the top. And it's right beside or in between several of the other houses. The Iron Age will come later. It's much, much harder to make iron than bronze. I was at a conference and they were making, trying to make iron the old-fashioned ways, the, the prehistoric ways, the medieval ways. And somebody was trying to make bronze in the corner, using similar, just as an offshoot. And while we were coming out with lumps of iron like this, they went, look, we have bronze, and it was the size of my fingernail. 
No, I mean, it's difficult, but the iron, once you get it, you can make bigger and better items from it. And so it's tricky though, you can't accidentally make iron. It has to be passed on and it takes hundreds of years to get across to Europe. But here in the Iron Age, on the Azov, we have houses, we have something called Sudrain that I'll come to, and a block, which I will come to as well, particularly Scottish. And we've got the, uh, the uh, New Stone Age there, we've got the Bronze Age there, and the Iron Age houses right next door, overlapping a little bit, covering some of the Bronze Age. Here is one of the Iron Age houses. It looks big and expansive because they expanded it. They had a house, they used it for a long time, they knocked down the walls, lowered its level, and then built a bigger wall outside. So just like you or me, they actually go, we need a bigger house, we want it to do something else, we want to do adapt it. Still got halves, but they're using upright stones as well as divisions. A little bit of change in house design going on. Other designs are changing too. Now remember that you don't start on a Friday in the Bronze Age and you're in the Iron Age by Saturday. It's not Friday night, Saturday that you change. It's over a long time. But this technology must have been wonderful. You take the grain, you put it in a trough, and you rub the stone on it to grind the grain up. It's backbreaking, especially when it's in a trough. You've got to lean over the trough and you're grinding for a long time. The stone is heavy. They then had saddle crones in the Iron Age. It's slightly like a saddle, like that, and you use that rocking to actually help to actually rub the, the crone. It's a much more natural position to do this. So this is an improvement. And underneath, souterrains. Here are the houses. There's one that curves away into there, and there's another one that goes into another house here. The lens is slightly fisheye, so the stones are not really curved. But it's only 60 centimetres, so two thirds of a metre about there high, and six metres long. What it's used for, we're never sure. Lots of ideas. Could it be a grain store? Well, there's some sign of grain in one of them. Could it be something to do with workshops? Well, there's a bit of smithings left in one of the others. So perhaps you choose what you're going to do with this cellar-like feature. Is it a defense? Is it somewhere you can retreat? Is it a storehouse? We don't know for sure. Well, that's a lot of archaeology is we don't know. But these are scattered around, and you will find these in Orkney, you will find them in Cornwall. It's a very Iron Age design. Now the rock is half of it. The sea has taken the other half. It's a very, very hefty piece of design. There is the corner of the house, and that is the thickness of the wall of the block. <coughs> Excuse me. It's very heavy engineering. The living space is this in the middle, and a little gap between the inner one and the outer walls. It's holding that building up. So if you were building it 2,000 years ago, and you then later on, 1,600 years later, build a house on top, which is a big house. It's very, very substantial. It's been eroded by the, the storms and the sea, but the sea is a very destructive element. That's what it probably looked like, cut away. So quite nice, except that it has no windows. Uh, you have a hearth, you may have a, a well in it, and you have little troughs. The gap between the two are held together with crew stones, which is exactly like dry stone walls in my homeland of Yorkshire. To hold the wall together, you have through stones which help to hold it all the ways together. But probably steps up through, round it, certainly steps in some of the blocks. And a fair well bit of wood seems to be used here. Well, you may not have ordinary wood, but your water is coming across the Atlantic. And with it comes driftwood. So maybe that's the use. This is what you will see when you stand with your back to the sea. This is the inside of the block. And just through there is the gap, which actually takes you, could take you up round originally. Nice little rooms inside with a nice piece of stone here. And uh, when excavating, when you come across these, they actually make a really good place to sit with your back against it. So it's a very practical, as well as being quite a nice design feature. There's a trough. You can hold water in that. You take clay, you take stones, you seal up the gap between the stones. And you could put fresh water in it, sea water in it, 
And just as you go to scour grey, they will look just the same from the Neolithic. Some designs work so well that we just keep using it. Let's looking down on that gap between the two. It's reasonably wide, um, unless you've eaten an awful lot on this cruise. <laughs> um, in which case you might be a bear in a tight wedged space like Winnie the Pooh. But it's, it's a reasonable width. You can get through it, uh, not sliding, but with a bit of a shuffle. And look at the quality of that build. It's fantastic, 2,000 years old. And it's been standing there for 2,000 years. There's nothing primitive about these. But there's another one that we will drive past when we land on uh, Chetland and we drive through there. Just before we leave the town, there'll be a lock that lay. And here is another block. And it's solid on the outside. There were no windows, there's just one door, and they were built very high. There were some, which is around Scotland, uh, there's something like 800 of them or more even in Scotland, usually close to the shores, always very visible. You see the gap between the walls here. And this is Moosa Brock. We will clip here from the mainland of Shetland across to Moosa. And this is mostly, well, it's not mostly because it was largely intact but has been reconstructed. There is your entrance and there is this massive bulk. No windows, as I say. Probably you could stand on the roof because if you built that, would you not want to be able to stand on the roof? So it's common sense says that you would be able to. Uh, it would just be too frustrating not to be able to. But the smoke inside would have been raised up and gone to a high level. But almost certainly you would end up with, uh, with um, pink eye, conjunctivitis. Uh, if you haven't got windows, you will end up with smoke coming off of the fire. So it's not a comfortable place. It's safe. It's very visible from the shore. But is it for defence? Well, you're often on a cliff edge, so that compounds the safety element. Is it just to say, look, we're big and we're strong, so don't even bother? coming to attack us, it would work, because you just know that they would retreat inside and you were not going to get in. Is it status? You could see another block from where you were. I can't imagine, well, they might have been signaling stations, but the chances are you'd burn your roof down. And so we don't know what it's for, but they did make a lot of them. And is it competitive? Well, they built one over there. We have to build one over here. Because if we don't, we're the lesser neighbour. Keeping up with the Joneses is a very, very strong human instinct. And that's what we're talking about. In all of these eras is human beings living their lives, having the same feelings as we do, and just being human beings. Human nature is strong. So we build complex things like this. This is the inside of Moussa Brock. It's huge. And there's the cliff. And you're taking the stones from around and using all the stones which are uh, on the shore and building this vast, vast structure. There's a closer image of it. Now, if you go to uh, Orkney, we won't go this far around, but there is the Brock of Gurness. There's several lots of rocks in Orkney. And you can see inside, you can see some steps going up the gap there, the singular entrance here. And a wonderful image of all the village over time, over many centuries, that built up around it. So were they living here and retreated inside? Or was one family living there? There's one single street that comes out, again, right on the cliff edge. When you stand at that block at Yarlsoff, just let your imagination go. Think of these images and how it would tower up above you. And the impression it would make to anyone who was sailing towards Shetland, towards the south of Shetland, or indeed what kind of signal it gives out. But for sure, they were saying, we're clever, we cooperate together, we can build this, we have manpower. So it has all sorts of messages that come across. In Scotland, the Iron Age turns into the Pictish Age. In England, it becomes the Romans, because they invaded. But in Scotland, the Romans didn't conquer. They did come up and they brought their armies up and they had a grand victory, which had the general not been called back to Rome, might well have started the invasion and successful invasion of Scotland, but it all stopped. They also said that the Scots weren't interested in being civilized. They, were, they didn't like baths and things like that. So the Romans tried to say, well, it wasn't worth it. So we'll just leave them to be the barbarians that they are. Uh, that was their excuse. Uh, it sounds very like an excuse to me. 
But here, the peak dish follow on. Now, the peak teeth are simply the Latin Roman word for the painted ones, because they were tattooed and colourful. So the Romans, being the Romans, didn't say that tribe or that tribe or that tribe. They just said, oh, you're north of us, and you're all on one geographical area, so we'll just call you all one name. We don't care who you are, because you're either Roman or you're not. So the ones that live up there are the Picti, the painted people. Now then, they built not just blocks, they changed the design, and they built wheelhouses. So here's the block, and there's an image of how the block is built with its blue stones for the walls. But here is a wheelhouse, so obviously made, because it's like a, the wheel spokes without the hum in the middle. And right here you can see the edge of one that was built, with little spurs coming out. And then this one is actually another one that was built crashing straight into that at a later date. So they're still substantial, they're still big, but they feel very different when you go in. And we can go into them. So you can walk literally from the Neolithic into the Bronze Age houses, into the Iron Age houses, into the Iron Age block, turn the corner and walk into a Pictish wheelhouse. Not many places that you can do that in the world. So this is the one that got truncated. So there you have a nice half in the middle and the, the spurs that come out with very neat stones at the end holding those walls together. And the entrances are low and you would have to sort of duck to go into them. Oops, come back. And here is inside one of the houses, a central half and little rooms. Not that different to those Bronze Age ones except in the structure. You still have a half with little rooms around it and now it's very imposing with the walls coming slightly inwards so that the houses did this, so that your roof was small enough to get what little bits of wood that you had to make a roof with, or to be able to keep going with the four walls and put stones on top. And some of these cells in one of the others is like that. It's completely stoned with a four wall roof. Remember, this is 2,000 years ago. That's the slope and how it's coming up, and these are the ones that have stone all the way across inside. You, when you go round from the shore side, you'll go into a wheelhouse, and then you'll walk round on some grass. And when you get round to the part at the back, they'll start talking about the Viking area at the back. But to your right is a little path that goes down into this wheelhouse. And the beauty of the sound systems that we have means you could walk around the site and still listen to the guide quite clearly. So take the opportunity to go down into that wheelhouse. Because it may not well have a central roof, but it's dark. It's, some people say cozy. Other people say claustrophobic. <laughs> Depending on your tendency, you will feel one or the other. And some say, I could live here. And others say, I couldn't live here. <laughs> Just see how you react to it. Remember there would be a fire. So this is the one that you go down into, and this is a secondary entrance here. These little tiny rooms, you're certainly safe in them. That's for sure. Now just down the road, when we drive there or back, we'll point out to you, just as you cross Shetland's air field, and you may have to wait for the planes to go. So you have modern technology shooting on and off one way here, and then just here, is Old Scat Nest. We will drive past it, we haven't time to stop. This is what it looks like now, a wheelhouse. That's what it looks like when they're excavating it. You have to sort a lot of stone that's fallen in. And there's their reconstruction. Nice circular stone house, just not, not tall, this one, this is one they hypothesized about the roof. And they've built it so that you can go into a reconstruction. So here's an image and you have a nice bed in one of those little rooms, you have the smoke. The smoke does sit up here mostly, so if you're fairly short, you're clear. But the thing to notice is that when we walk into the wheelhouse, it will just be stone. But you are walking into someone's home from 2,000 years ago. They would have had wooden objects, they'll have had bed, they'll have had cloths, they'll have had fabrics, they'll have had pottery, sitting either stewing above the fire or beside it, keeping warm. They will have had wooden trays, they will have had little pots they made, they will have had wicker baskets. Their house would have been full of things, full of food, full of materials, full of items, just as we have. Uh, I think decluttering isn't an option in a house like this. I think you just have to store it in there with you when you're safe. But the materials you have might include, and these are reconstructions, things made from whalebone. 
Because if a whale comes up, you would use it all. You'd use the skin, you'd use the fat, you'd use the bones, you'd use the, the, the vertebrae to make cups out of. You have soft soapstone that the Vikings so loved, and you can make shapes with them, you can make bowls, and you can, this is what's a very fine turned piece of wood. And we go, oh, they wouldn't have made pieces like that, I bet they would. Because they're just like us. We whittle something together, and gradually over time, you want it to be a nice item. And we think, oh, they'll have rough cuts, rough bowls. No. Just like us, they want it to be nice. And someone will learn to make very nice ones and produce them for the community. And you'll have your wool as well. So you would have items that you treasured, that you were very proud of, and you enjoyed using. There's also things we don't know what they use them for. And these come from various different sites, some in Orkney, some in Shetland, some from Scot Scottish mainland. Painted pebbles. Any ideas? Is it mystical? Is it shamanistic? Is it just a pattern? Is it a game? When we were digging on the, the site I, around for 10 years, we had a dairy farmer who worked with us, who was one of our co-founders, and every so often we'd run off down theories about things that we'd found. And then the little voice in the corner would say, you didn't know it might just be for fun, don't you? Because he said, I sit there on my farm, and I'm outside all day, or most of the day, unless I'm milking the cows, and I will do something similar to whittle away the hours. They said, just beware, it may just be fun. We are human beings again, we, we do like it, but they're doing the same pattern. Is it because it's a natural pattern to make, or is it because there's a stronger meaning to it? And the more we find them, and the locations that we find them in, the more we will know about them. Which is why when you find something, you're not allowed to walk off with it. Because where you find it says what that item was for. You know, was it in the kitchen area, or was it somewhere else? Was it, it, it tells you the story. So it might be a jolly good item, but you take it out of context and it's lost all of its archaeological importance. And do you know what? One item can change history. One location can change history. The Nessa Vodka temple says changed our view of the Neolithic. Now you can't pick out all of the Nessa Vodka, but the point stands. One thing can seem different to everything else. If we walked off with it, we would never know. So even a painted pebble might be important. But they're not primitive. These are from, okay, 750 before the Viking Age though, and 28 silver pieces were found on an island just off Shetland. Silver pieces, a spoon with this wonderful dog head. And here you have a silver gilt chapel and the sword is as part of the scabbard with this wonderful an eye and a nose coming up here and its mouth. Beautiful, beautiful metalwork. So people have acquired the skills of making silver, doing wonderful things with it. Now, we look at that compared with what the Neolithic had, and we say, oh, they're so much more advanced. Well, yes, because the technology is advanced. They have more materials to hand. But the people who lived in the Neolithic were exactly the same as us in their ability. It's just that the, the technology that they had is different. I'm sure in a couple of thousand years, they'll say, goodness, do you know what they used to do in 2019? You know, can you imagine living like that? They'll say something about the toilets we use or something like that. that we so barbaric and so primitive, and yet something wonderful will be invented, and it will all be very, very different. And it's big jumps like that that change what we do. So there's this wonderful bowl, and often this is in Edinburgh. If you get to Edinburgh and you go to the National Archaeological Museum, go and find St. Ninian's treasure. And this was found by a schoolboy. He was put in a nice quiet patch when they were doing a public excavation, because he couldn't do any harm. And he found this, which is great for the boy, really peeving for the rest of them. <laughs> I have actually done that on our site. We did something similar. We, put, we, we actually buried bits of somebody's ancient Arga stones that had been dismantled so that they could actually learn how to use metal detectors properly and what they should do when they found it and all that. And then they found some of the iron working slag, which is what we were looking for oh. elsewhere. Uh, you do have to say thank you nicely <laughs> and not be jealous. You're very pleased to find anything. And it's really good when a child finds it because that inspires them for the rest of their life. Things like this, this brooch, just beautiful. Now the Vikings, when they come in, we've traveled around town, time around here, 
And here at the back is the Viking settlement, about 850 to 1300. And Colleen told us yesterday about how the dates within are all varied because they're able to do proper scientific, decent excavations which can test the soil, test the analysis. And so they're able to find the layers correctly. Whereas when it was excavated before, it was a bit rough and ready. So more news will be coming from that site. But we've still got roughly these dates to work with. And they live very differently. You can see it's rectangles, long, long buildings. And there in the aerial shot, you can see how the Neolithic was these little ones here. There's these round sort of clover leaf ones. We head into the big rocks and the wheelhouses here. And they're very different. The Vikings used virgin territory. Everyone else is built on top. You've got all this landscape, and they go, I think I'll build it here. There was something there, and I'll build it there. And you use the old buildings as a store and a barn for a while until they fall down and that kind of thing. So you gradually work your way around. But the Vikings used what seems to be virgin territory. Very long buildings, a smithing area, a barn. The scale of them is completely different. Long buildings, a barn, and a good paving in the middle, and spaces by the side, and housing areas. It's very, very different. I will leave the Viking description to the Viking experts but you can see the difference. And when you walk around here, you can feel the difference. So remember, you are literally going to be in the footsteps of these people. We can't walk in their time. We can't travel in time. But we can literally walk in their footsteps. And that is quite astonishing. When you look down from the, the, the new building, the medieval building, this is what you can see, the long lines and a very different landscape to how the prehistoric people lived. To take us into the medieval, we travel up the island a little bit, or down, depending which way round we go. Uh, some buses will go one way and more, some will go the other. Here is the island of St. Ninians here. And this is the mainland of Shetland. And this wonderful spit of sand, which is called a tombolo, not a tombola, a tombolo. And it's this raised area of sand so that you can walk between the two. And up here on the island, they found a chapel. It's got pre Christian burials. These burials are stone lined boxes. And they're north south. They're not respecting the east west Christian ways of burial. But there are babies laid east west with little tiny crosses put on them. It's obvious, but you couldn't say Christian more obviously than that. Wonderful gift to an archaeologist. East, west, and with crosses. So you're looking at a place where there was a transition over time. And they built a chapel, just to re re emphasize the whole thing. During the Viking period, this is. What we have later, at about not long after that chapel is built, another section, which is here, and it has a funny little round piece here. And that's the reconstruction that you'll see on the board. Nice, very steeply pitched roofs, because that's what thatch needs. And then this round beer barley. Now, beer barley is a very particular kind of barley that you get up in this part of the world. And uh, if you're in, or when you're in Orkney and you're in Kirkwood, well, if you get the opportunity to have beer barley bread, any sort, it's lovely, it's great. Uh, but they will only make it there now. But this is where the barley was processed. So you're actually stepping forward in time a little bit more. And then the house that was on top of everything, and everything was buried. It goes on till, well, Scandinavian rule ended late in Shetland, 1469. And then very soon after, this next generation, Earl Robert Stuart, who was the Lord of Shetland, he had a new hall, and his son, Earl Patrick Stuart, nothing to do with Patrick Stuart, Star Trek makes it so, but it makes it very easy to remember his name. Uh, so Earl Patrick Stuart built a Laird's house. We don't know what name was given to this house. There it stands, and there's a wonderful spiral staircase here. And I give you full permission if you're there when I'm there to laugh as I climb up. It's great for photographs, but when I go up ladders or spiral staircases made of metal, you will see my knuckles go white. It's just something I, I'm not good on them. But to see archaeology from a, a good vantage point is worth it. So do go up the spiral staircase, and you will be able to look down into these wheelhouses and across at the Viking area. It's a good vantage point. It was all sacked in 1608. There was arguments, as you tend to get, landlords and tenants and all of that. Put it very bluntly, there's your, your viewing platform. It's not terribly high. 
uh, my husband and me, I'm such a coward. But <laughs> then you look down into here, and there were graves set down into it. This happens because you have a ruin, and you have a nice flat area. Now when you have a flat area, it's great for using for anything, in this case, for graves. But all through history, with all the periods around the prehistory, if you have a house, and it's round, and there's one doorway, and you abandon it, and the roof goes in, the sand and the earth, and if there were trees, there'd be leaves. Well, if you ever, ever empty a pond, and you leave it for six months, it will be mostly full of soil, because the, everything gets blown in, but it can't escape. So that's how things get buried. And houses get buried really easily, because they are like a little enclosed space, and hold it all in. So you end up with this nice level flat area where the house wants to been. And on our side that I ran, we went to the field, we knew there was an Iron Age settlement, and we looked at where he put the round cattle feeders on some very nice, convenient flat circles. And the cattle, back feet, were standing on the edges of the Iron Age houses. So we had to very delicately explain to him, could he politely please put them somewhere else just for the moment while we looked at what was going on? But that's what happens. Flat areas are convenient. You reuse them, you build on top of them. That's how one house ends up on top of another. Because if you leave it, it builds up, and you can think, oh, I can use it as a nice foundation. So all of this, apart from the house, was once buried. And because of a storm in 1800, it revealed the stones and opened it all up. In 1814, Sir Walter Scott visited. And he thought this house was rather splendid and said, oh, it's the Earl's house. Now that's what Yarlshoff means, Earl's house. And you know, a nice poetic name goes very nicely with a nice site. So Yarlshoff it became. Because it, it conjures up something, it sounds good, it sounds imaginative. And that's good, because when we go to Yarlshoff, I want you to use your imagination. I want you to walk into that area. I want you to walk into those houses. I want you to remember that it was 4,500 years ago that somebody lived there with their stone tools and their wood tools and their ivory, walrus ivory. And I want you to imagine them in the Bronze Age houses a couple of thousand years later with this new shiny stuff called bronze. And it makes weapons. And in the Iron Age, where they decided it was worth building huge rocks. Why? What drove them to such energy to do that? And then the wheelhouses, so, so dark, but so, well, prolific and, and familiar <coughs> to them. And then the Vikings come and go, no, we'll do it our way. So we do things differently. We, we, we have our culture, and we're going to do it our way. So their culture is different. And as you walk around through time, as I say, there's not many places. <laughs> You can go for a walk in half a morning and cross 4,000 years of history. But enjoy, at each stage, just pausing and thinking about the lives that each of Even in those very few Neolithic stones. <coughs> when we go to Orkney, the houses we'll see at Scarborough Bray, and the temples that were buried under Nessa Brodia, and the standing stones will bring it more to life. And I'll talk more about that tomorrow. But then as you go on, traveling time, you are standing where they stood. And it's a great privilege. And one of the great privileges of being an archaeologist is you get to peer into other people's lives. So, Yolzoff is a treat in store ahead of us. We have Orkney first, by one of the quirks of how the ports are going to work. Uh, we can avoid all the big, big ships if we go to Orkney tomorrow. That's one of the reasons. So we'll see the Neolithic, but then you will get this great, um, great journey through time. And uh, I hope you thoroughly enjoy it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jeremy. We have time for a couple of questions. We do have time for questions. Okay. Yes, sir. We'll start back yes. here, please. Do you have an idea oh, we just wait for the microphone. Yes. Do you have an idea of what caused them to settle there in the first place and what caused them to stay all these years? <laughs> uh, what caused them to settle in the first place? Uh, we are human beings, and if we know that there is an, if a traveller goes by accident, there is a lady on Shetland whose captain and whole crew fell overboard about 100 years ago, and if that in fact, and she ended up two days later with a biscuit and a quarter pint of milk, 
in Norway. She didn't have to sail, the ship took her there. It took her longer to get back by the modern transport of the day than it had for her to drift to Norway. People may have drifted there and then come back and said, hey, there's this land. Now, when you go to Shetland, it's a, it's a wondrous place. It's not easy. If the sun shines, it will seem idyllic, and if it rains, you will have some clues to just how tough it can be. Uh, it certainly won't snow on us, but, uh, but it's green, and it's pasture land. Now, people travel, and bearing in mind that in those first days, your average age is about 35 life expectancy, if you're lucky. That means that if you're, well, if you're younger, you're dying a bit younger than that, how much of your population is made up of, and this doesn't really bear thinking about if you've had teenage sons, they are teenage boys or young, young, young men. Oh my, he says yes. <laughs> all that testosterone, all that I can do it, all that I'm invincible, fearlessness. There's an island over there. Come on, guys, let's go. Let's go prove that we can get there. Let's go and just be done. Or everyone else is saying, it's not room for us, go. One or the other, we need a bit more space. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons people leave. We are explorers. Why have we put men on the moon? Because it's there, and because we can, and because we want to show that we can. And once we've been there, hey, we're even more curious. We want to know more about it and find out more. So there's this new land that's different to our own land, and you're inquisitive, and you can make it like Once you're there, it's probably a lot easier to stay than it is to come back. Uh, and people live there because they do. Why do people live in Naples in the, the, underneath Vesuvius? Because they do. I lived in the south for 40 years. My mum was from Yorkshire. And lots of people said to me, I think you belong up north, which I took as a great insult. I'm here. Why would I want to do that? And then I did move up and I went, oh, I feel at home. But why did I live there? Because I lived there. You don't necessarily change. This is what my father said. All those midden heaps are where our ancestors lived. This is where we belong. And in the Neolithic, they've put up huge stones that say, we live here. This is our home. So home is wherever you choose to make it. How they got there, they must have had boats. Uh, the great holy grail is to find some of those boats. But by the Bronze Age, they're making boats with great carpentry. There's a Dover boat in Dover in the south, and it's a stunning piece of carpentry and skill and knowing which wood to use. So they have knowledge, and they can use all the imagination, <coughs> excuse me, all that engineering skill, all the knowledge of how to use material goods. We take a piece of wood, and a real carpenter will just go, mm, yeah. <laughs> different wood has different te technical bits to it, different strengths, different uses it can be used for. If you know your natural world that you live in, you know that. Or somebody in your community will know it. So how they got there, the answer is people traveled in the Neolithic. That's quite clear. There are connections everywhere when they went there. And after that, well, we lived there. And then the Vikings came, and they lived there for a while. Why people leave is because, well, there's a food shortage, there's a famine, there's illness, they've seen another land, all sorts of reasons. So I hope that answers you. Yeah. Another question, yes. Yes, that's you. Oh, do we need a microphone? Yes. <coughs> Get in there. Thanks. Uh, sorry, it's just to follow up on why people would, would actually be at Yarosov. Mm. Um, the, the the site psychic expert. No, no. Yes. <laughs> the, the site itself is located, obviously, at the southern tip. And it's right by some of the worst seas that there are in that part of, of Scotland. The Roost, it's called. The, the tide, the rip tide that goes around the southern part of Shetland is very, very dangerous. Yalsov is located just to the north of that, and immediately to the north of Yalsov, where, as uh, Gillian pointed out, there are um, the, uh, the airfield is and where the planes go across. That is a flat area. It's a portage area. It's a place where you could drag your boats across from one side of, the, of Shetland to the other and very, very easily. And it's a safe passage, therefore. So the location of Yalsov, I think, is more predicated on the location of the safe passage around the southern part of Shetland than the part, and avoiding the dangerous waters. So I think it's actually a really superb location. Yeah, it's, uh, we often look at it from modern eyes. 
Or you think, why would you live here? And they're looking for what works for them. And uh, yes, yeah, so as the planes come and go across, remember they carry Viking ships across that same space. I think it's wonderful that planes are using the same spit of land that the Viking used to go in the same directions, more or less. Thank you. Wonderful. Mike from here. How much of what we find on this site is religious? Uh, there's nothing overtly uh, so, and yet we are we are spiritual beings. Uh, we do tend to make patterns. We do tend to see things, and all through archaeology, we do have elements of this. This is not a religious site, as such. I mean, yes, we have a chapel built there. But there's no obvious sign. It's not, um, I hesitate to say ritual because it became the joke after time tea. If you said ritual, they went, ha, ah, you don't know what it's for. And so well, let's say ceremonial, shall we? <laughs> um, and religious. Uh, there's no specified space or location for it, but you don't always need that. But perhaps those pebbles are part of it, the, the spots on it, spots of something that's. It's very easy to do, but it could be hallucinogenic as well, or Jainistic. But there is no, not in Yarzov itself, as far as I know, how about you explain it, Yarzov, there is nothing ritual, ceremonial there at all. Compare it with when Nick talks about the mess of vodka. And that is so not settlement. It's so not domestic. It is very, very ceremonial indeed. And that is going back. 5,000 years. So people are capable of building huge, perhaps they even knew. Or it's a long way between the two, but maybe. It's, yes, they may travel for it. Maybe that's why the places are so big, maybe not. Uh, more information as where people came from and the like will help us to know that. But not in the Altoff itself. No, uh, not as yet. Let's put it that way. Archaeology always says yet. Because somebody may come up next week and go, look what I've found. Well, that's what you hope for. More questions? I see a, a hat. Was that a, no, that was just a scratch. <laughs> it's things like an auction. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Thank there been any human remains found Oh, any human remains? No. I didn't know of any. I'm getting a shake of the head from uh, President uh, Yarsov, but uh, none, which is, well, you're burying people elsewhere, is the answer, and you're keeping life and death separate. Through most of these, you have the houses for the living, and you have the houses for the dead separately. And through the Neolithic, you're building mounds, which are houses for the dead. So there's no great sudden invasion of people buried in a pit thoroughly or thrown and tossed away, that kind of level. So, no, which is, um, if you have bones, you can do analysis. So, but sadly, not in this case. No. Another question? Yes, right back here. Yeah. 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 Yes, oh, there we are, sir. Uh, a question about the uh, ladder and habits uh, and facilities for the, for the previous structures. So, can you say that again? Did the ladder and habits? Oh, did the latter inhabitants use the previous ones? Oh, we do. Everybody does to a certain extent, if, even if it's only robbing the stones. So we don't all know that's archaeology. Don't touch it. Let's preserve it. Well, that is very new. Until very recently, they would take one look at a building like that and go, useful stone. Let's take it. Let's recycle it, as we say. Then would you, why would you not? Because there's a tumble down ruin, it's no good to anybody, and there's the stone, which is really useful, which is why there's so little of the Neolithic left. Because it's just been used, used, used. The Iron Age was built slightly over the Bronze Age, which ironically preserved it. Presumably it filled in at some point, and they then built over it. And the Brock survives because it was completely buried and submerged. So there, some fall out of use and preserve a few pieces for us, and others have just been ransacked. Just as they, as they do, or they would perhaps move out and leave some things, store some things in an older one. But if they were 
fairly clean uh, materials. There must be a lot of organic goods that were being used, but that's all gone. The stone is the structure, but all your belongings. Remember that picture of the house with its baskets and its wood items? All of that is gone because it just decays. It's just what happens. So some usage, certainly usage of the space, um, because we do that. We're, we're good recyclers, just whatever they say politically. We do, but we preserve now is the difference. Oh yeah. Should we take one more, or are we at time? Yes. 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 How much is known about the people who came to this place over the ages? Now they fit into the great European migration patterns. Uh, people who came to Shetland, do you mean? Or generally? To this particular site. This, this particular site. Because there's no skeletons, no bones, it makes it tricky to find where they grew up, which is the wondrous thing we can do with the calcium of the teeth, the enamel of the teeth. We can know where you, were, where you grew up as a baby as a child, as an infant, because that's when your teeth form and it contains some of the chemicals in the soil, but we don't have that. So all we're going on is cultural. Now Shetland is halfway between Norway, and well it's got Norway and Orkney, and then Scotland, and you would travel using the time of year that's good to travel in whichever direction it is. Uh, the short answer is a work in progress, I would say, pretty much. Uh, ideas abound, but certainly people were traveling, and that's undeniable, uh, throughout the, the western part of the world, throughout the whole world. People have always traveled. And we should never underestimate that desire to explore. You see an island over there, it will not be a whole generation before somebody goes over and goes to it. If only because the youngsters will go, well, if you're not going, I'll go. I'm afraid that, that attitude is there in every generation, and it's what makes us human. Because what you do is you say, well, I can do better than you did. I can do better than Dad did. I can do better than, than and I'm going to do something new, and I'm going to do something different. And so you push the boundaries. And we're always pushing boundaries. They started finding out how to make metal, then they found out how to make another metal. They found out how to mold items. They always, were always inventing, we're always moving forward. And one thing about archaeology is that it's very heartening to know that human beings are as inventive and as imaginative as they actually are. And how we do progress. We are never static in any of those eras. We were developing. Now it's not progress of time. It's just that we have different materials. Because the human being is always a human being. It's not that they were knuckle dragging apes. They were just like us. So think of them as just like us, living in their homes, but whether it's 4,000, 3,000, 2,000 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, recognizably like us. Different clothes, different materials. But enjoy yourself and enjoy your week tomorrow. We'll be talking to you about that tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you.